the mantle didn't hide anything. You could see Mantle's whole life on his face. The fair-haired kid playing baseball for the most storied franchise in the history of sports. He was perfect. For that time period, he was the perfect fit. He wasn't larger than life, he was life. But yet, he still had this aura about him that he was just like one of us. On the ball field, there was something very dignified and heroic about the way he carried himself. But Mickey's life overall was not always a study in dignity. A lot of sadness, there's a lot of regret, and there's a lot of tragedy involved. He was a stronger, bigger man when he knew he was dying than he ever was in life. He was a bad boy sometimes, but when he was good, he was very, very good. There was something dramatic about him coming out of the on-deck circle and walking toward home plate. There he was. Oh, gosh. No matter what you were doing, you automatically, your eyes went right to him. You could hear this rumble through the stadium. And then the fury. He put his soul into every swing. All the muscles and the straining in his neck. He said, I put everything into my swing, including my teeth. One of the things about Mickey was always that potential, you know? You never quite knew. Something great was about to happen. It just exploded off the bat. Oh, Ooh, oh wow. Oh, God. It was going up. Holy cow. Up, get out of here. Up, get out of here. It looked like somebody had taken a gun and just shot a bullet right at the facade. Look where he hit the damn ball. I could close my eyes and see the arrows showing the projector. 374, 118, how high it was, where it hit, and how far it would have gone. They would bring in these scientists, rocket scientists, and say, well, if it would have cleared the stadium, that ball could have gone 700 feet. Maybe hit an alien on Mars, and they'd have some cartoons, some, you know, extraterrestrial go, hey, where did this come from? You know. There was something about Mandela that screamed out, the natural. He's a God-made ball player. It stirs the imagination. You could make a case that no one in the history of sport ever fit a team, a town, and a time more perfectly than Mickey Mantle. From the early 1950s and into the 60s, the Mick was the quintessential American athlete the center fielder and centerpiece of the most dominant and visible team in sport, the New York Yankees. Nick, how would we do today out of the stadium? You win we the won two, two games. Yeah. How did you do? Well, I got three hits. three hits. You know, I don't want to mention that one of them was a home run, do you? Number 41, ladies and gentlemen. He was humble and often shy. Attention made him uncomfortable, but he could not escape it. For a generation of adoring fans, Everything Mickey Mantle did mattered. The way he smiled, the way he ran out his 536 home runs, the way he played 18 big league seasons through crippling injuries and late night carousing. And even when his playing days passed and his three MVP awards and seven World Series championships had been committed to memory, those same people embraced the Mick's private struggles their childhood hero proved just as flawed and human as they were. To them, Mickey Mantle always mattered. He was a true American icon, fair-haired, innocent, indestructible. But up close, he was blemished and vulnerable, an almost mythical character raised in the Dust Bowl at the height of the Great Depression, as far from the big city as one could get. Elsie's Cafe, that's where we ate dinner at. Down Main Street in Commerce, 
was Highway 66. We go down and sit on that rail and watch these people go by, going to, I guess it's California or New York. It wasn't stopping in commerce. The vast majority of the people around here, some way or another, were attached to the mines. Mutt worked most of the time underground. He was what we all called ground boss. They dug shafts. They may be 200 feet deep. They may be 450 feet deep. It was dangerous. There were lots of people killed. And most of the deaths were from huge slabs falling upon people. It was into that dark world of danger and death and the zinc mines of his hardworking father that Mickey Charles Mantle was born on October 20th, 1931. He was the oldest child of Mutt and Lovell Mantle of Commerce, Oklahoma, a likable and mischievous kid from the start. He was a great kid. Everybody wanted to be around Mickey because he had good ideas about things to do. He'd come up with all these games that was fun for him, but uh, I'm not for sure everybody else in the game was having that much fun a lot of times, you know. He'd take us out to the chat piles, and I had a BB gun. He'd line us up, count to 10. And we had to be a certain distance away, <laughs> or we'd get it pelted pretty good. I was a majorette in the band. He and his friends came to the football game. I thought Mick was the most handsome guy I ever saw. He had a crew cut and he had the Commerce High football jacket on. They called him the Commerce Comet. He was fast and fearless, no matter which sport he played. But Mickey Mantle was born into baseball. He was named after his father's favorite player, Mickey Cochran a Hall of Fame catcher from the Detroit Tigers. And with baseball in their blood, father and son formed an uncommon bond with the game and each other. The biggest thing in his life was when his dad took him to St. Louis to see the Cardinals. My dad didn't drive at probably 35 miles an hour. It was 300 miles to St. Louis. It took us more than a day to get there. Mickey would always say, Dad, I can run faster than you're going. He'd say, OK, get out. He certainly didn't want his children following in his footsteps. He wanted Mickey to have a better life. And he had a great love for baseball. Mutt was very serious about his training at Mickey. Dad got off work at 4 o'clock. Mickey had to be here every day. He'd always be right here as soon as his dad got home. It was trouble, big trouble if he wasn't here on time. They had a little old plate. He'd stand up at the plate. They practiced until you couldn't see. He would pitch right-handed, and my granddad would pitch left-handed to him. He was teaching Mickey how to switch hit. He got to where he could hit a lot of home runs. He could hit them a long way. Now, we did get to chase the ball around on the other side of the house when they went over. You never seen him without a baseball bat. They played for hours and hours. They were obsessed. Mutt was pretty hard on him. Mick told me I could do really, really good in a ball game, and Dad never said, you did well. He said, you can do better. That really made Mick try even harder to please him. He could have done anything in the world for his father. Soon after high school, Mantle signed a contract with the New York Yankees. In the minors, he was an erratic shortstop, but he could hit. In his second year at Joplin, Missouri, Mantle led the Class C Western Association, batting 383 with 26 homers and 136 runs batted in. He was proving to be quite a bargain. 
Tom Greenwood was really the only scout he talked with. He said, I'll give you a Yankee contract and $1,100. That's what me got for signing, $1,100. Mickey Mantle came to the Yankees in 51. Casey Stengel, the manager of the Yankees, promoted him, talked about him endlessly through that first spring training. There was a tremendous dynamism about Mantle. He was like a runaway Mustang. Mickey could do it all. He could run, oh boy, could he run. They said, watch this kid. He could run like a deer. One morning, they were going to see how fast everybody was. And they lined up all the outfielders. When he ran, <laughs> it looked like the other guys were standing still. We found out he could run like a deer. Where did this guy come from? Man looked like the kid that delivered your paper. The high noon sun. The hayseed from Oklahoma, literally carrying a $7 suitcase. He's the caricature of the bumpkin looking up at the skyscrapers, and the head keeps going up and up. We stayed at the Concourse Plaza Hotel, and uh, we got to be very good friends. I was 19 years old, and he was 18 years old. We had dress codes, and Mickey would buy some lousy ties. We ate a lot of hot dogs and cheeseburgers or pizza. We didn't know what the hell to do. It wasn't just off the field that Mantle had trouble. After a dazzling spring and a hot start to the 51 season, Mickey struggled. Maybe the Yanks had made a mistake in sewing the number six to his uniform. A not so subtle hint that he was expected to follow in the mythic footsteps of numbers three through five, the last of whom was entering his final season. He never had time to settle in. The moment he set foot in Yankee Stadium. The first day, he was the heir, the successor, to Ruth and Gehrig and DiMaggio. Boy, that's a load to put on a 19-year-old kid from Commerce, Oklahoma. There were fans that booed him every time he came to the plate. Wait a second, he's supposed to be the next great one, but he doesn't play that way. He makes mistakes. He strikes out too much. And watching him kick his glove and break his helmet and show temper and pout, things they never saw from the great DiMaggio, was a very, very hard transition for Yankee fans. You're striking out and people calling you a bum, go back to Oklahoma, and uh, Joe really never was friendly with Mick. You know, he never really tried to make him welcome to the team. When Mickey came with the Yankees in 51, Joe DiMaggio didn't talk to him for half the season. Having the fans and the media put on him the burden of the great Yankee icon just overwhelmed him. On July 15th, manager Casey Stengel told a still struggling mantle he was being sent to the minors in Kansas City. There, Mickey's hitting troubles continued, but by fate, he was just a short drive from Oklahoma and his father, Mutt. He was down in the dumps. His dad decided he should go to Kansas City and visit with him, and did. And when he got there, Mick told him, he said, I think I may as well quit. I think I may as well give up the game. Give him a real good tongue lashing. That's all the guts you have? Then get your stuff together, we'll go home. I'll put you to work in the mines. You can do that the rest of your life, just like I'm done. He wanted his dad to sympathize with him, and he did not. They talked most of the night. I was hoping he wouldn't pack his bags. He said, well, Dad, I want to stay here, and I want to try to make a go of it. Well, all right, if you stay here, he said, I want you to quit acting like a baby and get out there and play ball like you can. That bristled him up, and boy, he went back there, and I mean, he started hitting that ball. It wasn't long after he returned to the team in August 1951 